Okay, and I guess I can start. This is an interesting time. I haven't seen one like this before. And I'd like to start with the traditional lands recognition. The Tans say, hello, bonjour. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional meeting ground and hope for hope, home for many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Sotu, Blacktooth, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and the elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us, and the youth that inspire us. A tradition that dates back centuries, land recognition now calls us to acknowledge that we are Treaty 6 people, to remember responsibility, to deepen our understanding of the treaty, to participate in and support the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation, and healing. Um, now, my name is Brenda, I'd like to welcome you uh, to Westwood, everyone, a special welcome this morning uh, to those who are first time visitors or consider themselves newcomers or are returning from an extended absence. Westwood is a welcome, welcoming, nurturing, and inclusive community where all people are invited to rest, grow, and serve the world. Um, yeah, my name is Brenda and my pronouns are she and her, and I am your service leader for this week, and I'm glad that you have joined us today. After the service, we invite all of you to visit, chat, and discuss any questions that you have. And next week, uh, we have O oh Sacred World Now Wounded with Dr. Robert Wizerna. And this will be another entertaining musical Pete Seeger service. To receive information about our upcoming services and events, uh, you can sign in at the guest book at the back and include your email. And you can also sign up to receive an e-newsletter on our website. Oh, sorry. We'll now have our prayer lead. <laughs>
Okay, and I guess we'll have a lighting of the chalice. Thanks for the prelude and I guess you have another hymn. Now I know this rose will open. Candles of joy and concern. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on our week, recall the milestones and the joys, concerns and sorrows, and the changes in our lives. Those who need our healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. And I will invite you now to light candles of concern and celebration. Uh, for those of us who are online, um, you can please raise your hand and then we can acknowledge you. For those in the building, you will be invited to come after forward and speak and then light your candle as the next person speaks or to light a candle in silence. And we are also happy to bring a microphone to you if you wish. So to begin with, we'll start with the people that are online and you can put up your hand if you're there. Okay, uh, please join us for the affirmation. May the light guide us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve and see and treat, and love and trust in God. Okay, now we have our uh, first solstice advent candle. We are entering the season of anticipation, the marking of time leading up to an unexpected event. Here at Westwood, we mark the weeks leading up to winter solstice, the turning of the earth, which places us at the farthest angle from the sun, the shortest day and the longest night of the year. Uh, the candle of hope represents the resilience of humanity through life's challenges and trials. This candle is lit in the direction of the east, the place of new beginnings, the breath of fresh air, 
Together, we work towards a world where all living beings may experience safety and security, beauty and promise, and we help each other to remain hopeful when this work is hard. So we have the offertory. Uh, each week during our Sunday, Sunday service, we take a few minutes to acknowledge the gifts that we bring to and receive from the compassionate community, gifts of talent, time, and treasure. Today, we are blessed with the musical talent of Jennifer McMillan, as well as the gifts of time and service from those who plan, greet, coordinate our sound and video systems and clean up afterwards. If you wish to make a gift of treasure, the information for doing so is on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, please don your mask. Join us as we sing, From You I Receive. Tim is the dark of winter. the reading of the hope poem. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a tune without words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little girl, bird that kept so many arm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Emily Dixon. So now I'm very pleased to have Janet Pivnik coming in as our speaker this morning in Zoom World. Janet is an educational developer at Simon Fraser University, a member of Beacon Unitarian Church in New Westminster and a Unitarian ministerial aspirant. And we're glad she's come so far from BC to see us on Zoom here. And Janet will talk about the gifts of pause. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you all for the invitation to speak at Westwood today. 
It's an honor and a pleasure to be visiting your loving community in this way that technology makes possible. <clears throat> in this, the first week of Advent, Mark Nepo offers us a poem about waiting called Understanding Leaves. The leaves do what we can't. They wait their whole lives. At first, they dream of air and wait to slip from wood. Then they dream of openness and wait to stretch in light. Then they dream of thirst and wait to soften in the rain. At last, they dream of nothing and simply unfurl. Photosynthesis is how this waiting is described in the physical world. The mystery of waiting is what turns light into food. To wait beyond what we think we can bear is how things within turn sweet. The time of Advent that is now upon us is a time that invites us into waiting. Truth be told, we humans are not very good at this act of waiting. I don't mean the kind of delicious waiting that children enter into as they wait for Santa to arrive. Their anticipation of something good around the corner is unbearable, but also sweet. I don't even mean the difficulty of waiting to get something that we want. In our instant gratification, acquisition-filled fueled society, that kind of waiting has its, has its challenges. But I'm thinking of something deeper, the kind of waiting that requires us to let go of control, that makes us surrender to the pace of the universe and allows the gentle unfolding of things. The kind of waiting that Mark Nepo indicates is the hallmark of the life of a leaf. <clears throat> You would think having spent our last couple of years in suspended animation, wondering when life will return to normal, that we would have developed some waiting skills. But it just does not seem to be a quality that comes easily to us humans. Yet here we are at the beginning of Advent, waiting. And here you are in this liminal space, suspended time between saying goodbye to a beloved minister and forging a new direction with a new minister waiting. So this is going to be a bit of an interactive homily, so I'm going to offer you a question to consider. When you think about being in a period of waiting, what is the emotion that arises in you? Not the thoughts, but the feelings. If you're on Zoom and you're moved to do so, you can write your response in the chat. If you're in the church, please just say out loud what arises as it comes to you, and Brenda will repeat it at the mic. We'll start with the people in the church. What does waiting evoke in you? Anxiety. Anxiety. Having a dream or, or did I hear? Could you repeat or or was that okay? <laughs> Anxiety. Okay, anxiety. Yeah, that's from me. Frustration. Frustration. Pent up energy. Pent up energy. Okay, anxiety, frustration, pent up energy. These are some really common uh, responses to. Um, waiting and being in the place of waiting. As I've been contemplating Advent, I've been asking myself three questions. Why do most religions have a practice of waiting woven into the faith? And I see that um, there's just a um, response that's come up in the chat, which is anticipation. So there's also a bit of that um, excitement that, that comes with waiting too. So questions, why do most religions have a practice of waiting woven into the faith? Why do we humans struggle so much with allowing situations in our lives to unfold at the pace that they require? And how could we greet a period of waiting in a way that embraces all the beauty that a time of pause offers? So let's start with a bit of history of Advent and how it became woven into the Christmas story. What is this period of waiting all about? Originating in the fourth or fifth century, Advent was actually a time of preparation for the baptism of new Christians 
which took place on Epiphany in early January. Jesus' birth didn't factor into Advent at that time. <clears throat> it wasn't until the sixth century that Advent became tied to the arrival of Christ, but this was a time of looking forward to the future and the second coming of Christ. Monks at that time began a practice of spending 40 days in penance, prayer, and fasting from the time of St. Martin's Feast, St. Martin's Feast Day on November 11th until Christmas. In the Middle Ages, Advent became linked to Christ's first coming, the birth of Jesus at Christmas. Today, Advent focuses on the arrival of Jesus in three ways. The first arrival of Jesus as a baby, the second arrival of Christ that Christians await in the future, and the arrival of Jesus into the heart of Christians. And that's our, our tiny little bit of, uh, of Christian history. <clears throat> the idea of fasting as preparation for Christmas was dropped by the Protestant churches during the, the Reformation and the Catholic Church in the 1960s. And this shift may have something to say to our contemplation of the challenges of waiting. Uh -huh. Waiting for Jesus's arrival put the focus on the outcome at the end of the waiting period. Modern day practices such as the use of an advent calendar to count down the days to Christmas increases this focus on the event at the end of the waiting period. Yet in the Eastern Orthodox and Celtic Christian faiths, where the practice of fasting is still maintained, the focus is on preparation, on the process rather than, than the product, so to speak. Christine Sign in her book, Lean Towards the Light, This Advent and Christmas says, we're entering a season of waiting not a passive, idle, and maybe boring waiting, but an active soul searching and prayerful season. She offers, I love the Celtic invitation to begin 40 days before Christmas day, before consumerism ramps up to a fever pitch and we become too distracted and overwhelmed by the busyness of the season to really take notice of what matters most. <clears throat> she continues, and here I've removed her references to Jesus so that it can have meaning within our Unitarian context. This is a time for deep and serious reflection on how we live our lives and commit ourselves to the purposes of divine energy. How can our world be made whole again? Such an important question, especially this year as we, we struggle with issues of climate change, racism and violence, pandemic, economic downturns, and the growing recognition of inequalities in our society. We still need to move towards healing and love and wholeness, not brokenness and hate and divisiveness. Matthew Humphrey from Ahoshik, Canada, talks about the celebration of Celtic Advent. Advent is an opportune time for we who care for creation to resituate our hearts away from consumption and towards compassion and care. He suggests that fasting could be a time to separate ourselves from doom scrolling social media. Writing in 2020, he said that his family was going to help one another resist the urge to embrace a device when we might otherwise embrace one another. It's a way of reclaiming our own focus on what we value. What if we think of a time of waiting as a time of preparation? Does that shift help us to dig in and find meaning and get past our discomfort with being in a state of betweenness? I wonder how we would have experienced the time of isolation from loved ones during the pandemic if we had seen it as a time of spiritual preparation. <clears throat> Why is waiting something that we struggle with so much, particularly in our culture? Well, I have a top 10 list of reasons that waiting can be challenging. We'll see which of these reasons resonate with your own experience. Number one, we like freedom and independence. We don't want to be passive actors in our lives. Number two, waiting feels like a waste of time and we view time as a valuable resource. Number three, our culture doesn't value waiting. We want what we want when we want it. We eat fast food. We get fr frustrated when our computers don't respond immediately. We have become a culture of now. Kate Sweeney, a psychologist who studies how people cope with extreme uncertainty, suggests two of the most prevalent challenges with waiting. So this will be number four and five on our list. She says that waiting combines two challenging states of mind, not knowing what's coming, uncertainty, and not being able to do much or anything about it, 
so a lack of control. And neither of those are comfortable states for humans to be in. And when you combine them into these waiting periods, it really kind of boosts waiting into this extra suffering kind of state compared to other kinds of stress. She says, from an evolutionary perspective, if you don't know what's coming or you can't do anything about what's coming, in both cases, that's a pretty dangerous situation. We're wired to be uncomfortable in those situations and be motivated to find ways to resolve our uncertainty or regain control. When we can't do that, it's very challenging. So number four and five, uh, waiting puts us in a state of uncertainty and waiting uh, has us in a state of feeling like we don't have control over our lives. Number six, along with a lack of sense of control comes a feeling of powerlessness and helplessness, other feelings that are uncomfortable. Number seven, not knowing an outcome can make us feel stuck or immobilized. Have you ever been in, in the situation where you're waiting for results, let's say a medical diagnosis or whether you've got a job or not or how you did on a test and you find yourself prefer, preferring to have bad news rather than no news? With bad news, you can act, you can make plans, you can find solutions, but not knowing leaves you in limbo. Number eight, when we're waiting, we can experience a void that we try to fill. Often we fill the time with ruminating, with worry, with should haves and what ifs, with self blame. Number nine, we are goal oriented and waiting gets in the way of achieving our goals. And number 10 on our list for today, waiting doesn't fit with how we expect life to happen. The counselor and writer, writer Ria Vanessa Caliste writes, I existed with the belief that if I put in the work, set the goals and persevered towards achieving, I should achieve this success immediately or almost immediately. This belief often led to frustration or giving up when I didn't see the results I wanted right away. I also would look at others in a similar field and compare their success with mine, not realizing that they all would have gone through a period of waiting before achieving the success they now enjoy. Yet now I know that all things I work towards isn't just about putting in the work, but having the patience to wait for the hard work to yield its benefits. You see, when after all the effort, all the work is completed, there's a period that arrives when you must just do the action of waiting. There's no predetermined time of how long the wait will be. It can be a day, a week, a month, a year, or many years. So that was our top 10 list. Do any of those challenges feel familiar? familiar? So here's the next part of our participation, but you won't be sharing this with anyone else. It's just a moment of reflection for yourself. What is an area of your life in which you find it difficult to wait? So here's an example for my life. When I'm in conflict with a loved one, I find it excruciating if I can't resolve the situation immediately. I want to talk about it and work things out. Sometimes that's the very wrong thing to, to do, either because the other person isn't ready or because that's not how they handle conflict. But waiting for resolution makes me very agitated. My discomfort about not having control and my uncertainty about whether the relationship will survive the conflict, two of the sources of challenge on our list, become triggered. So again, I'll just give you a minute here. What's a situation in your life that challenges you to wait? And this is something that you don't need to share with anyone. I'll just give you, oh, about 20 seconds of silence to, to contemplate. Okay, I'm hoping that you have something in mind from your life. Different faiths have different ways of understanding the state of waiting. Mickey McCandless, a Methodist director of spiritual care, says that biblically, 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 that's a hard word to say, biblically, waiting is an active verb, indicating that to wait is to be aware through all of the senses of what is occurring around you 
and discerning the right time to do the next thing. To wait is to be open to experiencing the holy moments around you, to experience feelings emanating from another person, to hear words in a broader context, or to experience the divine presence through others. Buddhism and Taoism both have the concept of non-action. In Taoism, this concept is called Wu Wei, which refers to the cultivation of a state of being in which our actions are quite effortless, effortlessly in alignment with the ebb and flow of the elemental cycles of the natural world. The idea isn't to do nothing, but to align action with some, something that is greater than ourselves. In the Unitarian faith, we would call this acting in accordance with the interdependent web of life of which we're a part. But we aren't able to have that alignment without slowing down and listening and waiting and discerning what is needed. Gil Fronstel of the Insight Meditation Center says that forbearance and patience are also important, though less appreciated practices of non-action. Human life, Gil says, is filled with situations that frustrate our preferences, destabilize our equanimity, and evoke our ire. Because it is rarely beneficial to act or react when we are frustrated, unstable, or angry, practicing patience may be the best approach to avoid making a difficult situation worse. Such, such non-action is called forbearance when we also have to tolerate discomfort, waiting for the right time to act. What he describes there is very familiar for me, familiar to me when I'm in conflict in the relationship that sense of forbearance, of sitting with and tolerating discomfort so that we can find the right time to act. Gill suggests a variety of reasons that refraining from action is beneficial, including providing us with an opportunity to learn about ourselves. As we attempt to stop our usual activities, we discover the impulses that make stopping so difficult, Fransdell says. In this way, we learn where we are attached and we learn about the emotions, impulses, and beliefs that keep us caught up. When we refrain from doing something that we habitually do, we might get to see for the first time the cost the activity has had, sometimes over a lifetime. Finally, it may be only when we have ceased being active that we can see that we have more choices in how to act. This is only the tip of the iceberg of the spiritual interpretation of waiting and the benefits that waiting, that waiting can provide. Even these few examples suggest that waiting offers presence, discernment, clarity, noticing and awareness, connection, gratitude, equanimity, kindness, better results, self-knowledge, and leading a fuller life. Now, when you think back to the situation in your life that you identified, where waiting is difficult, how would it shift for you if you thought of waiting as a time of preparation? Could waiting for discernment or clarity or connection or kindness help soothe the anxiety and tamp down the impulse to act? Could it give meaning and purpose to the wait? Mark Nepo ends his poem, to wait beyond what we think we can bear is how things within turn sweet. What is waiting to sweeten in you? As we enter this time of Advent, could you consider this next four weeks as a time of preparation for that sweetness to come to its full fruition in its own good time? May it be so. Well, thank you very much for teaching us through some of the different uh, tools that we can have for waiting. And in Westwood, I think we do really need a lot of those tools right now. <laughs> thank you very much. Hey, please don your mask and join us in singing Oyoyoya. One zero two zero. We're getting our hymn books up because this one's a little bit uh, tricky. 
1020. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we are within. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Elizabeth Sell Jones. And uh, we'll see. <laughs> Please stay and visit with each other. For those of you on Zoom, you're also invited to visit with each other by remaining in the main Zoom area or joining a breakout room.